And now, stay tuned for the mystery program that is unique among all mystery programs. Because even when you know who's guilty, you always receive a startling surprise at the final curtain. In the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. S-I-T-N-A-L Signal Signal Gasoline Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the Whistler's strange story, Ticket to Murder. Standing at the window of the cheap hotel room and looking out over the outline of lights and neon that was Kansas City after sundown, Eve Benton felt a dread pressing sense of loneliness, concern. That the condition would pass, she was certain. She'd managed before, she would manage again, some way. But she wasn't thinking of that now. Eve Benton was being sorry for herself, forgetting her good points, the quiet, restless beauty in her face the sullen attractiveness of her features. She was annoyed at the city and the world. She raised the window as though voicing of her resentment, and she heard other words nearby. They came from the next room. You're saying 30,000. That's the deal. Mmm, a lot of money. A lot of money. Not for the return of the Perriman necklace. 30,000. And no questions asked? Is that what the insurance company says? Yeah, that's what they say. You really got the Perriman necklace? That I gotta see. <laughs> does this look like it? Yes, it does. You smile strangely, don't you, Eve? Listening in ironic amusement. 30,000, one of the men next door said. They're talking in thousands while you stand so close by, wondering where you'll get the money to pay your hotel bill. You start to close the window when the voices suddenly grow louder and rage in anger. You can't get away with this. I'll worry about that. You just worry about this. You freeze to the spot, don't you, Eve? Your outstretched hand touching the windowsill remains fixed, rigid like a statue, and then you hear someone climbing out onto the fire escape. A man is outlined by the staccato flashing of a neon sign on top of the building next door. He hesitates. Glances back at the room he just left. You get a clear look at his face, and then he starts down the fire escape steps. You lean out. See the man drop to the ground and disappear into the shadows of the alley below. You wait, staring. Then run out of your room into the hall. The door to the room next door is partially ajar. You run to it and glance inside. (gasps) A man on the floor, lying very still. He's dead, isn't he, Eve? You're about to turn and run when your eyes fasten on the telephone. Hello? Hello? Desk? Hello? Yes, what is it? Hello? Hello? Answer, please. Hello? You lower the phone, staring. Unable to speak because of something you see. Something near the dead man's hand. A wallet, isn't it, Eve? Yes, with part of the contents spilled out. A few bills, and among them a train ticket. Something that you could use. Are we still connected? Yes. Yes, Eve. 
a train ticket for the West Coast, San Francisco, and almost $65 in currency. It's an answer to your problem, isn't it? You lose little time in packing, leaving your room by the same method as the man who fled only a few moments before. The fire escape. Later, as you settle safely back in the seat, the train begins to roll. You casually present the stolen ticket to the conductor. You've succeeded, haven't you, Eve? No questions asked. The train gathers speed, hurrying you away from Kansas City. You relax now, become aware of your surroundings, the other passengers. Notice the man opposite you, his face half obscured by a newspaper. And then... Oh, I'm sorry. Did I startle you? Oh, no. No, it's just that... that you look like someone I... I knew. Well, now I've got another reason to be sorry. That I'm not. Uh, you, uh, just get on the train? Kansas City, yes. Oh, it's an interesting place. Yes. Yes, it is. He smiles, doesn't he, Eve? He can even do that. This man who pretends to be so nonchalant, so much at ease. You wonder how he would feel if he knew that you had recognized him. That you were certain he was the man you saw fleeing from the hotel room next to yours. That you shared his grim secret of murder. Something wrong? Uh, what? Well, the way you're staring at me. You said I'm not the guy you thought I was. Is there some other reason? No, no. No, there isn't anything. You want to read the paper? No, thank you. Oh, good. I'd rather talk anyway. Talk? Yes. We've some distance to travel together. There's no reason why we shouldn't become better acquainted. Is there? No. No, there isn't. No reason at all. <laughs> Tonight's $20 signal gasoline book goes to Mrs. W.G. Reed of Long Beach, California for sending in this limerick. My car seemed to need overhauling. The gas it consumed was appalling. Then signal I tried, and now when I ride, I can pay for my gas without bawling. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far, will go for the gasoline. <laughs> Our congratulations to Mrs. Reed for her very human way of describing the good mileage you enjoy with Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Too bad there wasn't room in her limerick to get poetic about all the benefits you notice when you switch to Signal. I mean Signal's snappy starting, Signal's peppy pickup, Signal's smooth, silent power. For it's a fact, mileage and performance go hand in hand. If you'd like to enjoy both, then the next time your gas tank gets thirsty, treat your car to the gasoline that's packed with go. Fill up with signal and go farther. You're unable to avoid the young man sitting across from you, aren't you, Eve? A man who's introduced himself as Frank Gilby. A man you're certain committed a murder in the hotel room next to yours in Kansas City. Later, he escorts you to the club car of the train, orders cocktails, and the two of you talk like old friends as the train roars through the night heading west. You're careful to avoid mentioning the hotel, aren't you? Leave it to him to take the lead in the conversation. All you want to do is get the trip over with and leave the train. But by the time you reach Oakland and board the ferry boat that will take you to San Francisco, the young man has become quite persistent. Miss Benton. Miss Benton. Yes? Oh. You know, I think you've been trying to avoid me, Miss Benton. Eve. Any reason? Why, I know, Mr. Gilby, I I've told you. <laughs> I was beginning to think I should take those magazine ads to heart. No, it, it's just that 
I've had things on my mind. I've been thinking about a job. Well, perhaps I can help you. I know a lot of people. No, I, I have something waiting for me in the city. Well, it was just a thought. In case it doesn't work out, I wish you'd give me your address. I'm not sure what it will be. Well, mine is uh, 4950 California Street. I've got a flat there. I don't believe I asked. No, you didn't. I'm forcing myself on you, Miss Ben. You try too hard. But do I? Well, don't blame me. I'd, I'd really like to see you again. Perhaps you will. Like I said, maybe if that job doesn't work out... Yes, yes, I know. 4950 California Street. <laughs> You want only to rid yourself of the persistent Mr. Gilby, don't you, Eve? Finally, once ashore and in a taxi cab, you feel he's no longer a worry. You register at a small hotel on Geary Street. Dismiss him from your thoughts. But late the following morning, as you're having breakfast in a small diner, you're listening to the radio, and something the news announcer says sets you to thinking about and Frank in again. local news, the Perryman jewelry case has reached a stalemate with the valuables still unreturned. According to insurance investigator Leonard Quinn, a contact with an underworld character in Kansas City failed to take place. It has since been revealed that the insurance company has made a tentative offer of $30,000 with, as we understand, no questions asked for the return of the necklace to their representative, Mr. Quinn, or to the home of wealthy Mrs. Evans Perryman in Hillsborough. However... Oh, well, I wanted to hear that. Huh? Oh, sorry, lady. The guy was just about through, though. Well, what was that name he mentioned? Mrs. Evans somebody? Uh, Perryman. Mrs. Evans Perryman. Lives down the peninsula. Perryman. I see. You acquainted with the lady? No. No. But I've heard of the name. Yes. The words of the newscaster set you to thinking, didn't they, Eve? particularly the mention of $30,000. That was the figure you heard Frank Gilby mention in that Kansas City hotel room. And you remember the name Perryman, too. Strangely enough, after you've taken a cab to 4950 California Street, walked up the stairs to Frank Gilby's flat, as you're about to knock on the door, you hear the words again. Poor Quinn. Yeah. That, uh, that 30000 on the Perryman deal. You get me the money, and you'll get the necklace back. Yes, that's right. Take a couple of days. The contact is out of town. Sure. All right, bye. Yeah. Oh, Eve, hello. Hello, Frank. Changed your mind, huh? Thought you'd look me up after all? Uh-huh. Well, how'd the job go? You all set? No, I, uh, I didn't go there. Well, maybe I can help on that, like I said. I'm sure you can. Well, come in, come in. Like I said, I'm sure you can help me, Frank. Well, anything at all. I'm glad you feel that way. Because I'm referring to the Perryman deal, the 30000 you are going to get from Leonard Quinn and the insurance company. What? Mm-hmm. The 30000 you wanted all for yourself. That's why you killed your partner back there in that Kansas City hotel, took the necklace I happened to be in the next room. I see. So you've got a new partner now, Frankie. Oh, have I? Mm-hmm. And uh, I wouldn't try anything if I were you. I've taken the necessary precautions. If something happens to me... The cops find out about that little accident in Kansas City, and they come looking for me, right? Right. Well, well, well. <laughs> Looks like I'm right behind the eight ball. You don't have to stay there. If you uh, play it right... That means... Your way. My way. Hmm. Okay. Have you talked with Quinn? Um, uh, no. Oh, now, now, Frankie. I think you have. <laughs> okay, so I talked with him. He thinks I'm, uh, I'm just a go-between. Naturally, you wouldn't tell you'd killed a man to get the necklace. Um, what sort of an arrangement have you made with him? He gives me the dough, and in a couple of days, uh, after I contact the guy with the necklace, I bring it back to him. That's all. Quinn trusts you that much? Oh, sure. I've handled deals like this before for uh, Mr. Quinn. When is he going to 
pay off. Tonight. Oh, fine. Well, it, it's all settled, then. I'll meet you here after you've collected from Quinn. Uh, what time? I'll be back by nine. <laughs> we'll open a bottle of champagne to celebrate. I'll buy. Naturally, it's your party. I'll see you tonight, Frankie. At nine. <laughs> It was simple, wasn't it, Eve? Easier than you thought. And now you're in partnership with a murderer. A temporary partnership, you tell yourself, and it'll be worth it. $15,000. After it's over, you'll move on, start a new life. Yes, it was all so simple talking your way into that partnership. But as the day wears on, you begin to wonder about it. Perhaps it was too simple, Eve. You really hadn't expected Frank to accept your demand so readily. The more you think about it, the more certain you become that he'll bear watching. Early that evening, you hurry back to his flat. And as your cab turns into California Street, you see Frank board a cable car. Uh, driver. Yes, ma'am? Don't stop. I've changed my mind. I want you to stay close to that streetcar. Sure, sure. But not too close. Okay, I get it. <laughs> At Montgomery Street, you watch Frank step into an office building. And sitting in the cab, you wait, keeping your eyes on the entrance. A quarter of an hour goes by, and then he comes out, walks back to the corner, hops onto a cable car as it starts to climb up the hill. Driver? Yeah, yeah, I know, the cable car. It ain't none of my business, lady, You're but quite I... right, driver. It's none of your business. <laughs> You follow Frank back to his flat, see him hurry inside. You're quite certain you know what he's up to, aren't you, Eve? But you want more time to think about it alone. So you tell your cab driver to keep going. Finally, you return to Frank's place. Well, hello. Sort of early, aren't you? I've changed my mind, Frank. I'd like to go with you when you get the money. Oh. Well, it's uh, been called off. Called off? Well, postponed is what I mean, until tomorrow night. I just got a phone call from Quinn. Said he hadn't had time to get the money from his boss yet. Oh, I see. Mm. Uh, sit down, sweetheart. Oh, I was looking forward to that champagne. Well, no reason why we can't celebrate in advance. I was hoping you'd call me. Were you? Yeah, I thought we might have dinner together. North Beach, Fisherman's Wharf, maybe? Sounds interesting. What do you say? Well, I've always wanted to see the top of the mark. Fine, fine. We'll start there. <laughs> All right. There's a nice little restaurant on Broadway I think you'll like. Best veal scallopini in town. <laughs> I'm sure I'll love it, whatever it is. Oh, Frank. Yeah? My gloves. I must have left them on the chair. Oh, sure. I'll get them. The moment he turns around, steps back into the room, you snap the automatic lock in his door so that it's unlocked. Now you won't need a key, will you, Eve? Then quickly you reach down and tear a hole in your stocking. In a moment, Frank returns. Here we are. Oh, thanks. All set? Off it. Oh, dear. What's the matter? Well, just look at that. A run in my stocking. Look at it. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's quite a run. Nicest one I've seen in a long time. <laughs> well, you won't mind stopping by my hotel for a minute, will you? It's only a block out of our way. Oh, well, of course not. Let's go. At your hotel, you leave Frank waiting in the cab parked at the entrance while you hurry inside the crowded lobby and ride on out through the door on the other side. You go back to Frank's place a block away, slip quietly into the apartment, find what you'd expected, an envelope containing $30,000 in his suitcase. You put the envelope in your purse. Well, Frank was going to double-cross you after all, wasn't he, Eve? Yes, you've proof of that now. You hurry back to your hotel and go quickly to your room. The whole thing has taken you less than five minutes. And now you put in a phone call to the railroad station. Check the trains leaving town and make your reservations. As you hang up the receiver... Yes? Yes, what... I got to wondering about you, sweetheart. Oh, Frank. Well, I, I'm sorry I took so long, but I... I had a long-distance phone call Hello? from my brother. What, news from home? Yes, and, and not too good, I'm afraid. Uh, my father has had another attack. I, I'm terribly worried. Well, that's too bad. Uh, 
Frank, about tonight... I don't feel much like celebrating, you understand. No, sure. I wouldn't be very good company. Oh, don't give it another thought, baby. We'll have dinner tomorrow night. All right. I'm really sorry. Oh, sure, sure. I'll see you tomorrow. You watch from your hotel window and see Frank get into the cab and drive away. Quickly, you pack your things, check out of the hotel. It's two hours before your train leaves time to have dinner. But first, there's one thing you must do. You've made up your mind about that, haven't you, Eve? From the moment you found the $30,000 in Frank's flat, you step into a phone booth and call the police department. What was that, man? A murder, Sergeant, at the Alton Hotel in Kansas City five days ago. The killer is here in town. What? I arranged a deal with Leonard Quinn, the insurance investigator. Anything to do with the Perryman necklace robbery? Everything. The party I'm talking about took the Perryman necklace from the man who was killed in Kansas City. Go ahead. Well, I suggest you contact Mr. Quinn. Get him to tell you who he'd made that deal with, and you'll have the killer. You'll give me your name, ma'am? No, I won't. Goodbye. (laughs) Now you're settled comfortably on the train as it moves out of the station rumble through the outskirts of San Francisco. You lean back, close your eyes. It's been a trying day, hasn't it, Eve? And you're tired. As you listen to the rhythmic click of the wheels, you doze off. And then suddenly you're awake again. You're staring at the newspaper headlines in the hands of the man sitting opposite. Perryman Necklace Mystery Near Solution. Local police link obscure Kansas City murder victim with theft. A cold wave of fear sweeps over you. Then he lowers the paper. Hello, sweetheart. Frank. You surprised? The switchboard operator at your hotel couldn't resist this ten spot. I see. How stupid of me. Wasn't very smart of you to walk out with my 30 grand, either. Isn't that what you were going to do? You got me all wrong, honey. I was going to surprise you. <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> okay. So each of us tried to double-cross the other one. What do you say we call it even split the money between us? All right, Frank. We ought to try to get along, sweetheart. You have something on me, and I can make trouble for you if I want to. Can you? You're in this as much as I am now. I can always say that you helped me do that job in Kansas City. Our coincidental appearances that make it pretty hard for you to deny Yes, I I guess it would. So let's bury the hatchet, hmm? Why not? And after we get back to San Francisco, we can do the town together, baby. Have a lot of laughs. You know, I got a hunch this partnership's going to turn out okay. I was just thinking the same thing. We'll just forget the past. Think only of the future. Right. A bright future, sweetheart. For the two of us. Here's good news for you motorists who will be needing a new battery this winter. Did you know there's now a new, finer battery guaranteed to last up to two and a half times as long as ordinary batteries? It's the new Signal Deluxe battery, guaranteed for a full two and a half years on a service basis. This amazingly long life is due to microporous all-rubber separators, which have been called the greatest improvement in batteries in 20 years. But longer life is only part of the story. Because these improved type separators hold twice as much acid solution between the plates, Signal Deluxe batteries deliver up to 35% more power. Yet this superior performance actually costs you less per month, which is really the only logical way to figure battery costs. What's more, right now Signal dealers are giving generous trade-in allowances for old batteries, plus liberal credit terms. No wonder drivers with an eye to economy as well as those who demand top quality, are both heading for signal service stations. They know that today's best battery buy is a quicker starting extra long life signal deluxe battery. It was a shock, wasn't it, Eve, to find Frank Gilby on the train after you thought you'd slipped away from him in San Francisco. You were certain you'd seen the last of him. 
and you'd have the $30,000 all to yourself. But then there he was demanding his share. $30,000, Eve, a lot of money. And you made up your mind that Frank wasn't going to get any part of it regardless. In the morning when the train pulls into Los Angeles, the $30,000 is still tucked away safely in your suitcase. And you're confident Frank Gilby will never bother you again. He'll never be able to involve you in the murder he committed in Kansas City. Yes, you're quite confident. Sure, aren't you, Eve? Even as the police board the train, step into your car, talk quietly to the other passengers. And then you find the lieutenant talking That's right. to you. That's right, Miss... Uh, uh, Benton. Miss Benton. He was sitting here opposite you, according to the conductor. Well, you say he fell off the train, Lieutenant? Oh, how horrible. Oh, he seemed like such a nice young man, too. You, uh, you didn't know him? Well, no, I'd never seen him before. We talked a little, of course, just <laughs> train conversation. Hi, you know. Hmm? Oh, it's you. <laughs> didn't waste any time getting down here, did you? Well, we've got to keep our readers up on what's happening in our little old world, you know. Come on, Lieutenant. I want this to hit the next edition. Uh, what's with this guy fell off the train? Where did it happen? Just out of San Luis Obispo. And he didn't fall. He was pushed. Uh-huh. Pushed? Why, what makes you think that, Lieutenant? Yeah. What's this all about? The San Francisco police got a tip last night. Phone call from a dame about a payoff. An insurance investigator was making a deal for the Paramount necklace with a party she said killed a man in Kansas City. Oh, another killing involved, huh? Mm-hmm. The insurance man was going to hand over 30 grand for the Perryman necklace. See, then you think the payoff was to be made here on the train? Yeah. Quinn completed the deal all right, because when his body was found, the necklace was in his pocket. Quinn? That's right. The man who was pushed off the train. Leonard Quinn. Well, he... He told me he was Frank Gilby. Well, he probably wanted to keep his identity covered until he'd completed the deal. I see. If our tip is right, the killer pushed Quinn off the train so that there wouldn't be any witness. Now, wait a minute. You think the killer who pushed Quinn off the train was the Kansas City killer, too? Well, that's what the woman who tipped us off told us. Now, all we have to do is examine all the luggage in these cars and search the passengers. Ah, I get it. And if you find the 30 grand, you'll have... We'll the... have our killer. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, Miss Benton, I'm... Sorry to bother you, but as long as we're here, we might as well start with you. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at the same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Remember, if you would like the fun of having your friends hear a limerick of yours on the Whistler, the address to which to send it is the Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles, 55, California. All limericks become the property of the Signal Oil Company. Those selected for use on the Whistler will be chosen by our advertising representatives on the basis of humor, suitability, and originality. So, of course, they must be your own composition. Featured in tonight's story were Joan Banks and Frank Lovejoy. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone and Adrian John Doe, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional. All characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at the same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. S-I-G-N-A-L Signal Signal Gasoline When you give to the community chest, you're helping not just one organization, but many worthy causes that directly benefit four out of every ten families. Think of that when you're deciding how much to give to the community chest. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>